How y'all doing? It is the end of day on a Friday. I hope you are having a good week. Hello to our replay, ch um, replay squad. I know which chapter we're supposed to be on this time, so we're not going to have a repeat. That's, that's highly important. So we are on 12. This is of rats and bowler caps is the title of the chapter. I'm going to copy this and put it in the chat in case you would like to read along. That is a possibility for you. Um, so what has happened so far is um, Milo, a um, poor unfortunate soul from the D&D &D universe, has been sucked into the Harry Potter universe and has learned that magic here does not work the same as the magic in the D&D &D universe. Um, he has fought what the people in this universe call a troll, but is obviously a giant. Um, in the third floor corridor, not the dungeons this time. Um, cause, and Fluffy and the troll fought. The troll eventually ran away into the Forbidden Forest. But not without Milo and the rest of the mod squad getting really beaten up like a lot so <laughs> um they're all now in the me uh, the medical wing having to deal with their injuries because when milo gets involved it's a whole lot worse than a bathroom getting destroyed a whole lot worse there's explosions there's lots of explosions involved. If you would like to read my favorite fanfic, um, which is Harry Potter and the Nat 20, if you would like to read the first part of it, the link is in the chat. Um, also, if you would like to read along with me while I read, I'm starting here on chapter 12 tonight. I think it's chapter 12. Yeah, it's chapter 12 we're starting on. Um, then you can read along with me as well. Harry and Ron were released Friday evening, but Milo and Hermione were obliged to stay in the hospital wing for the entire weekend. Gryffindor, and even a few Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw, well-wishers brought in flowers, candy, and cards to speed their recovery. Milo wondered idly where the students had got them from, since it wasn't like there were any shops in the castle, and the students couldn't just leave the grounds. Owl order, answered Hermione when he asked her on Sunday evening. Also, third years and above can go to Hogsmeade a few times a year. Milo dis was disappointed at how mundane the answer was, but liked the sound of Hogsmeade trips um, once he hit third year. Milo cut off that line of thought quickly. There is no way I'm going to be here in two years, he thought firmly. Why, Zook and the others are probably already paying to have a whole battery of divinations cast to find out where I am. Totally. And the reason that's been two months, why, they've probably just been trying to find a really good diviner to do it. Yeah, totally. Or a conjurer to plane shift me home. Milo sighed. They could have at least sent a setting once in a while, you know? Is that too much to ask? Of course, all this assumes they weren't TPK'd by Thaymor because they didn't have me to do, well, everything. Why the long face? Hermione asked, full of concern. I think, said Milo, that all my friends back home might be dead. What? she asked, her face gone white. That's terrible! Why, why, who... Oh, Milo, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. That's, like, about the worst thing I've ever heard. Milo blinked. He'd forgotten that the people here seemed to view death as more than a mild inconvenience. I, it's not so bad, he said. I mean, this isn't the first time it's happened. You don't have to put on such a brave face, she said. It's only me. Where, where I pay from, where I come from, you can pay to have people brought back from the dead, Milo said simply. It's really not such a big deal. Hermione just stared, thunderstruck. That's so... Hermione paused to collect her thoughts. 
You really are from another world, aren't you? Yeah, Milo said quietly. Everything was really... Hey! Milo heard a small, sharp voice say. Sorry, I know what this is and I'm getting excited. Um, Hermione, did you say something? Milo asked. Listen! The voice said. What? Milo asked, irritated. He got a flash of irritation, frustration, annoyance from his empathic bond. Morty, was that you? Since when can you talk? It's amazing, really it is, the voice, presumably Morty said. You remember to put a skill rank in disguise for script, as if you'd ever find any use for that, but you forgot that I got the speak with master ability? Morty crawled out of his home in Milo's bag and up his robes to talk to him face to face. Hermione had an odd look on her face, watching the exchange. Well, I feel that's more your business to keep track of, Milo protested weakly. I'm your class teacher, said Morty firmly. But you forgot my natural armor increased too, didn't you? No, don't tell me. I don't think my poor, adorable little rodent heart could take it. Well, yes, but... And it's been ages since I got any share of the loot! Mordecai continued, as if Milo hadn't spoken. Share of the... That's right, my fair share of the loot! I do all of the most dangerous jobs, distracting the troll, spying on Snape's secret meetings with Lucius... Wait, what? And what do I get in return? Supernatural power above and beyond that of any ordinary rat, human-like intelligence, uh, magical knowledge rivaling my own, the skill ranks of a level 5 wizard, but that's besides the point. What's this about Snape's secret meeting? Right after you were doing your crime scene investigating in the Forbidden Forest. I'm sorry, are you not taking me seriously? Because you're laughing. It's, it's hard to maintain a straight face, Milo said between laughs. When you see a rat make little air quotes like that. Stay on topic, would you? Snape snuck out to meet the smarmy git's father. Before you ask, yes, I could tell by his scent he, who he was because the oily one called him Lucius Malfoy. And? and well, what, what did they talk about? Milo asked, intrigued. You know, I got mauled by a cat once helping you, Morty said. What happened to stay on topic? Milo asked. I just wanted you to appreciate how difficult my job is sometimes. Uh, yes, yes, you are very appreciated. Now get on with it. Well, the sire of Smarm told the oily one that you weren't a wizard. Not a wizard? Milo asked, enraged. I will end him. I will show him which one of us isn't a wizard when I shove some high-powered arcana down his... And that he wants the oily one to have you expelled. Huh, Milo said flatly. Expelled? That's it? From where he was from, enemies generally wanted you dead, undead, redead, disgraced, disintegrated, detained, and were devoured. Being expelled seems so unimportant. It must only be phase one of his plan. First, get me expelled. Then, eaten by bugbears. That's what I assumed as well. So, boss, what's the plan? Oh, bar I forget, there's one other thing. Okay, said Hermione, as if it had taken her this long to work up the courage to mention it. What are you doing? I'm, I'm talking to Mordecai, he said. Can't, can't you tell? No, said Hermione. It sounded like you were spouting gibberish. You can, wait, you can talk to rats? You're, uh... Uh, I, I don't actually know if there's a word for that. A uh, rodent tongue? Rotten tongue? No, no, just this one. I'm... Oh, sorry. No, no, just this one. I'm the one and only Morty tongue, Milo said. He'd forgotten that the speak with master ability magically prevented anyone from understanding what he was saying to Morty, and vice versa. Handy, he thought. So what are you saying? Hermione asked curiously. Er, that was rude. I, I don't mean to pry or interrupt a conversation or anything. It's just not every day that... Um, oh, yeah, Morty was telling me that Snape and Lucius Malfoy met secretly in the forest, Milo explained, and that Lucius asked Snape to get me expelled. 
Hermione frowned. This was when you went into the forest to investigate the Agromantula, Hermione asked. I'd been meaning to ask, what did you end up finding? The Agromantula had a missing fang, Milo said, and that I couldn't have killed it with the log. But, but that means someone else must have done it, though I didn't see it happen. I would have thought it was Quirrell, but he was very clear about the fact that he was nowhere near the scene at the time. Also, the math on the experience points checks out if I split it 50-50 with a more experienced character than myself. Hermione blinked. You know, when I was in school, people said I was weird. It must be nice, Milo said, to have a backstory. It seems like a lot of work, mind you. You, you don't remember your childhood at all? Hermione was shocked. But before I came an adventurer? Uh, not really. I know that at some point I became a vagabond street thief, but I'm not really sure how that happened. But that's so sad, Hermione said, her eyes even misting up. It let me became, become a wizard younger, Miley, Milo said. It's sort of complicated and it doesn't stand up to close inspection. It's weird for me. This only became a problem when I came to this world. It's like I'm cut off from something. I don't suppose we can change the subject? What were you talking about? Hermione asked. Oh, oh, right. Snape trying to get you expelled? Only Professor McGonagall and Professor Dumbledore have the authority for that, she said. Short of the Minister of Magic stepping in personally, it's out of Snape's hands. I guess Snape could try to set it up so that they could have no choice but to... Ah, crap. The potion. Milo, Hermione said. Language! She paused for a moment. Also, what potion? For Snape's detention on Halloween, Milo said. I thought he was trying to kill me, having me make an exploding potion. But it was a test. I failed. Failing potions isn't enough to have you expelled, Hermione said. I mean, take Neville. Hey, said Neville from his bunk. He was back in the hospital wing after being mauled by, and they wouldn't have believed it if there hadn't been 12 witnesses, but mauled by a flobal worm. Flobal worms have no teeth, fangs, spikes, poison, spit, anything. Their one claim to fame is their mostly harmy, harmless slimy mucus. They'd quite forgotten about him. <sighs> Sorry, Nev, Hermione said, her face pink. No, it's not just about being even more hopelessly incompetent than Neville, Milo said, as if Neville hadn't spoken. PCs could be like that around NPCs sometimes. Snape told me himself, a newborn with a hint of magical blood could make that potion. All you have to do is stir it. You don't need to think about it or concentrate or anything. So, Hermione asked, what's your point? I couldn't make the potion, Milo said quietly. There was a meaningful silence. Maybe you had the ingredients wrong, asked Hermione. No, they were perfect. Snape even checked them beforehand. It's not like I kept it a secret. I am not a wizard like you are. A uh, witch, actually, Hermione said pointedly. But the only thing keeping me here is that Dumbledore thinks that I'm like you, said Milo. Only crazy and deluded, and even worse at magic than Neville. Hey! No, that can't be, said Hermione. If you weren't a wizard, the wards wouldn't let you enter Hogsmeade or Hogwarts. You'd suddenly remember an important meeting and run off, I believe. I suppose it depends on the exact wording of the spell. Maybe the wards target everyone who isn't a wizard, witch, squib, or magical creature or something. I don't suppose you have the spell description in the library? Um, said Hermione, I, I don't think so. More importantly, I've... Milo's tongue tripped over itself. I've... He sighed. I've already lost. Snape won. I'm going to be expelled. No, I think it would take more than Snape's word for something like this. It's completely unprecedented. The Ministry would want to get involved. Dumbledore, too. And McGonagall, of course. The department that handles underage magic. Uh, the point is, I don't think we need to worry about it until Ministry officials start showing up. Hello, said a cheerful voice, interrupting Hermione mid-sentence. Milo turned to see a portly... One little man. 
in a pinstripe coat and a green bowler cap. Three, major NPC, standing at the entrance to the hospital wing. Na Hermione gasped, her face completely white. Um, said Milo, uh, hello, sir? He was guessing wildly, but judging by Hermione's reaction, this was either a loco king, an evil vizier, or Lord Voldemort himself. Milo carefully rearranged his blankets so they wouldn't impede him if he made a run for the window and stuffed Mordecai back into his belt. Oh, that won't be necessary, said the man. I'm Cornelius Fudge, the Minister for Magic. Milo blinked. Ah, oh, crap. M -m Milo? Anastasia? Landon, Fudge interrupted as he moved to sit next to Milo. Yes, yes, I know who you are. Milo licked his lips, which had gone suddenly quite dry. He wouldn't be up to full hit points until midnight, when his second day of full bed rest finished. He slowly pulled both hands out from under his blankets so they wouldn't interfere with somatic spell components. This man, as Milo understood it, was king of an entire country of wizards. He probably had access to enough arcane power to rewrite reality according to his whims. I'm afraid there's been a spot of trouble, the minister said. I'm sure it's nothing, but it has a lot of us at the ministry scratching our heads. I'm here with some colleagues who are waiting in the hall. Your meta-witch was, was quite severe with them, uh, demanded no more than one of us be let in at a time, who are here to sort it out and solve the little mystery. Shouldn't take more than a moment, really. Hermione shot Milo a look of absolute panic. How can I help you, m my lord? Milo asked. Really, now, said Fudge. I'm not a lord, you know. Forgive me, your divine imperial majesty. The fat little man sighed and removed his bowler cap. Just Minister Fudge will do, Milo. And to answer your question earlier, all you have to do is follow me, answer a few questions, and brew a potion. We can have you back to your bed and friends in a few minutes. Milo panicked. It was the end of the day. He was almost out of spells. He could not prepare new ones until he could get to a spell book on Monday. I, uh, I'd love to, but I'm afraid I'm, I'm grievously injured, Milo stammered. I was thrown out a window just the other day, you know. Yes, the lovely Miss Pomfrey assures me that you're in good enough shape to move about, if only for a short time, said Fudge, and I'm afraid I, I have to insist. It's quite out of my hands, you see. But you're the... Milo said, before remembering who he was talking to. Fudge could probably lay waste to armies with a wave of his hand. <sighs> okay, I'll, I'll go with you, he said meekly. Good lad, said the minister, as Milo climbed to his feet. I want to go with him, Hermione said firmly. Er, said the minister. Well, shouldn't you stay here and rest? No, she insisted. I'll be fine. Pomfrey is just being overprotective. I'm not letting him go anywhere alone. You wouldn't believe what happens. Milo grinned. It looked like she was finally grasping adventurer rule number one. You never split the party. Well, um, very well, but let it be known it wasn't my idea. Hermione weakly struggled to her feet. Her head was still tightly bandaged, as was her chest. From what Milo could understand, witches and wizards, and muggles too, likely, had a completely different healing process from what he was familiar with. Milo moved next to Hermione, just in case, and together they followed the minister for magic. Outside the hospital wing's large double doors were four of his flunkies. These are my colleagues, Fug Fudge gestured at the underlings. Madulfa Hopkink from the Improper Use of Magic Office, he said, pointing to a stern, gray-haired witch. Dolores Umbridge, Senior Undersecretary to the Minister of Magic. Fudge pointing at what Milo could only assume to be a half-toad, clad in all pink. And Bodrick Bode of the Department of Mysteries. Fudge pointed at a sallow-skinned wizard. In the back, there's Walden McNair of the er, Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. I'm sure he won't be necessary. Fudge pointed at a huge wizard, standing head and shoulder taller than the others. This the little beastie? McNair asked in a low, oh, sorry, in a low rumble. 
Well, said Fudge awkwardly, that er has uh, yet to be determined. If you'll all follow me, Fudge asked with a small gesture. Milo frowned. Is his timid incompetence an act as obfuscation? Or is he really this anxious all the time? If so, how did he become the ruler of an entire empire of what are essentially demigods? He can't have, Milo realized. He's either a brilliant chess master behind his facade, or... Fudge led the group into the dungeons, but Milo barely noticed. Or someone else is the real power behind the throne. But is it Dumbledore, Lucius, Voldemort, or some third party? Either way, I really need to figure out how to pass Snape's test. It wasn't that impossible, really. All he had to do was get a cauldron to bubble instead of exploding. The only catch was that he hardly had any spells left. He had been using Scholar's Touch to catch up on his reading. Milo ran his fingers through his hair. He hadn't quite realized how vulnerable that made him at night. How long is it to midnight? He asked Hermione, who checked her watch. Less than two hours, she said with a yawn. It is way past my bedtime. Milo chewed his lip. His plan, he had a plan, of sorts. He just had to delay until midnight, and then delay for an hour while he prepared his spells. And then he had to figure out how to make a handful of spells designed for killing orcs in ten by ten stone rooms do something they were never intended to do. All the while with the most powerful men in the country breathing down his neck. Wonderful. I'm just, I'm sure if you just double check your measuring, Hermione said in an attempt to be reassuring, you'll do fine. Milo grinned nervously and steeled himself. He had the beginnings of a plan in mind. But for that, he would need spells. So, mm, my boy, where did you say you were from? Miria, Milo said proudly. City of light, city of magic. The Miyari government, though completely inept at dealing with dragons, goblins, and bandits, nonetheless had a sophisticated system of divination set up to detect citizens who didn't add the legally mandated city motto after saying the city's name. Milo wasn't sure exactly how far-reaching the effects were, so even here he made sure to say it, and for that matter, think it. Nobody knew exactly what the punishment was for breaking that particular law, because nobody knew anyone who had ever done it. Personally, Milo suspected that lawbreakers were retroactively erased from the timeline altogether. "'Where is that exactly?' asked Fudge. "'America? Europe?' "'Uh,' said Milo." He wasn't sure exactly how secret he was supposed to keep his otherworldly nature. On the other hand, Fudge was probably watching him with a battery of divinations, or whatever the local equivalent was called, to catch him lying. So I can't tell the truth, and I probably can't tell a lie. No, Milo said. Not America or Europe. And now I need a diversion. Did you see the ludicrous display last week? I dare say. I had more galleons riding on a wanderer's victory than there were in the Spanish Armada, Fudge said. Mind the cannons were riding all Nimbus 2000s, he said. That must have been the reason. Donated at the last minute by an anonymous benefactor. The wanderers, though. Rumor has it they were exper on an experimental new broom. Must have been rubbish, though. Milo's curiosity was piqued. If there's one thing every adventurer listens to... It's unfounded rumors told by little fat men. He knew his present situation was dire, but he just had to dig for information. An experimental broom, Milo asked. So I'd heard. Made by a total unknown in Wales somewhere. Doesn't even have a proper name yet. It's all very hush-hush, even to me. And I'm the minister. So you're a uh, ministership, sir. Do you have any guesses about who donated all the broomsticks? Off the record, there's only one family with the wealth and influence to afford a team's set of nimbuses with a vested interest in seeing the broomstick succeed, Fudge said conspiratorially. And that's the Malfoys. Mr. Malfoy is on the Nimbus board of directors, you know. Milo had no idea what a board of directors was, but he didn't care. Everything he heard seemed to be pointing to that family. The manner he first woke up in, Draco's very existence... And at the exact same age as him, too. Lucius in the forest, 
It wasn't Draco taunting him about Quidditch just the other day? Milo knew an adventure hook when he saw one. Later, Milo thought, first I need to avoid being expelled. Expulsion would be inconvenient and annoying, but it wasn't as if Milo had any vested interest in obtaining a magical education in the wrong sort of magic. Mostly, he just wanted to stay in Hogwarts because Lucius, for some reason, wanted him out. Ah, here we are, said Fudge, as they approached Snape's classroom in the dungeons. You know, when I attended this school, this is where they used to lock us up when we misbehaved. Ah, the joys of youth. Without even being prompted, McNair and Bode each opened one of the double doors, allowing Fudge to enter. Milo was still unsure if the man's bumbling nature was an act or not. Milo and Hermione followed, with Fudge's underlings behind him. Dumbledore, McGonagall, Snape, and a small group of men Milo didn't recognize were waiting in the classroom for them. Something about the way the group of men stood, and the fact that they were all dressed the same, made Milo think that they were some sort of wizard police or military. What was the word for that? They had a word for that, Milo thought, trying to remember. It was in one of the books that he had read with Scholar's Touch. Sitting in the middle of the classroom was a small, pewter cal cauldron. Next to it were the ingredients, such as they were, for Snape's test potion. Snape looked excited, McGonagall worried, and Dumbledore as enigmatic as always. Uh, I'm going to have to figure out who's reading this. Okay. Oh, God. I have to pretend to be under umbrage. Hold on a second. <clears throat> In accordance with Section 32.141 Alpha of the 1634 Statute of Inexplicable Phenomena of a Magical Nature... Umbridge declared in an authoritative voice, reading from a scroll she'd been carrying somewhere on her person, which states in the words of the great wizard Peabody, when something really, really, really weird happens, and hear ye, me, I do mean really weird, and lo, it hath never happened before, and neither sir nor gentle lady knoweth what to do, let the goddamn Department of Mysteries handle it, ye hear? And forsooth, maketh sure that there are at least a half dozen aurors around, if you know what's good for ye. The first preliminary inquiry to determine the nature of one entity known as Milo Amastasia Leandon, of a species yet to be determined, is to be convened under the suspicion of one Bodrick Bode of the Department of Mysteries, in the presence of six fully qualified aurors of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. Also in attendance are Hogwarts professors Albus Dumbledore, Minerva McGonagall, and Severus Snape. Uh, oh, Severus Snape. Sorry, I lost my place because this is a long paragraph. Dolores Umbridge, Senior Undersecretary to the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge, Minister of Magic, Mal Walden McNair of the Department of the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures, Mathilda Hoprink of the Improper Use of Magic Office, and Miss Hermione Granger. The objective of the inquiry is to 1. Determine the species of the individual in question, 2. If he turns out to be human, whether he is a wizard, squib, or otherwise. 3. If not a wizard, determine how he got past the magical wards protecting the castle and the village known as Hogsmeade. 4. If not human, to turn the inquiries over to the department for the regulation and control of magical creatures for study, and if deemed appropriate, execution. Let the inquisition commence. Umbridge put away her parchment and stepped back. Milo blinked. Well, he thought, this is unexpected. Bode, the strange somber man from the Department of Mysteries, moved forward slightly. Now, Milo, I want you to understand that these are just preliminary inquiries. There are a lot of unanswered questions, and we're just going to try and see if they're worth looking into this, if it's worth looking into this at all. That business about the execution is just a formality, he said in a dry voice. Milo had just started sighing with relief when he continued. Unless, of course, you aren't human and are some form of hitherto undiscovered magical creature, in which case you'll be staked, beheaded, buried upside down, and sanctifi in sanctified concrete for a year and a day, then dug up, salted, shot with 13 silver bu bullets, cremated, and disapparated into the sun. In my experience, that'll kill anything short of a Dementor. Milo laughed weakly. <laughs> so, Milo said nervously, how exactly are we going to go about this? The first test is easy enough. 
Your potions master was good enough to brew us up some veritasium. You just have to drink a drop. And what will that do exactly? Milo asked. It will make it impossible for you to tell a lie, Bode said. <sighs> okay, hit me, Milo said, and he reached out. Snape, with a grin, produced a tiny vial of a clear potion from his robes. For one brief, extremely embarrassing moment, Milo wished he were a bard in order to cast glibness. Snape poured out a single, tiny drop of veritasium into a glass of water, stirred it slowly, and passed it to Milo. Uh, Milo said, how long will this last for? It's not permanent, is it? Unfortunately, Snape said, it will wear off in a few hours. Okay, then, Milo said, and gulped the potion down in one go. To his surprise, it didn't really taste like anything, and it did not he didn't even feel different. Dangerous, he thought. A colorless, tasteless potion that makes one tell the truth? Now, said Bode, are you a human? Seriously, Milo asked. That's your test? Yes, I'm a human. What town or city are you from? Mira, city of light, city of magic. And in which country is Mira lo situated? Um, the Azale Empire. And on which continent is this Azale Empire located? Um, the Azale continent. Milo, are you, in fact, from another world? Yes, Milo said simply. Feeling he had to elaborate, he continued rapidly, the words almost spilling over themselves in an effort to be said. A few months ago, I was summoned, without warning, to a manor near the village I later learned was Hogsmeade by a group of Death Eaters. Oh, surely we're not believing this n nonsense, interrupted Fudge rudely. I must remind you, Dumbledore said calmly, that he is under the effects of Veritasium. That he must be deluded. His wild ta tales are proof of that. Surely you can see that, Albus. We should wait for Bode to finish, Dumbledore said, and then make a judgment. Very well, carry on then, Milo. I'll act as direct as I can. I'll be as direct as I can here, Bode said. Are you a muggle? No. Are you a squib? No. Are your parents wizards? I don't know. Are you an orphan? I don't know. Are you a wizard? Hells yes, I am, Milo said fiercely. And anyone who says otherwise has another thing coming. There was a low murmur from the Aurors present. Well, there you have it, Dumbledore said. From his own mouth and under Veritasium. I don't think this breach of my student's privacy has to go any further, do you? He could be confounded, Fudge said stubbornly. In fact, I'd bet my hat that he is. If you were going to come to that conclusion in any case, Dumbledore said, with a slight edge to his voice, then pray tell me. Why bother questioning him at all? The Board of Governors insisted, Dumbledore. It was out of my hands. I wonder how many of the governors are under the impression, mistaken, I'm sure, that their families would be put in danger if they didn't insist, Dumbledore asked. Albus, Fudge gasped, sounding scandalized. What are you suggesting? Nothing, he said. I was just thinking out loud. Don't mind me. As I am led to believe, Bode said, your potion master has developed a test which he believes can prove conclusively whether or not you do, in fact, possess any magic. Professor? Snape stood up from his desk. He looked almost happy? Snape happily terrified Milo far more than Snape wrathful. Most conventional tests of magic, Snape said in a lecturing tone, could be fooled if the subject is merely extremely incompetent or weak. Even the simplest of charms can be fumbled by a mentally deficient. That Milo is the worst student of magic to enter this school in a century is at least, at least, is not in question. What remains to see is whether he possesses any magic at all. Magic isn't a thing you just have, Milo thought angrily. It's something you have to work at, something you earn. You have to take magic for yourself. It isn't simply handed to you. To that end, I have developed a test, Snape continued. A potion that requires no thought, concentration, knowledge, or effort in the slightest. 
I will measure out the exact proportions of the ingredients, which will be checked by Albus Dumbledore and any others who wish to. All the boy has to do is pour them into the cauldron and stir once counterclockwise. If the potion is created, he is a wizard. If not, it will explode, and I will leave him in the more than capable hands of the Ministry to deal with as you see fit. Snape's expression harbored no doubt about what he thought should be done with the boy. Er, excuse me, Milo said. He could feel everyone's eyes on him. Does anyone have the time? There was a brief silence. Eventually, Fudge fished a gold pocket watch out from under his cloak. Half past eleven, Fudge said. So could we hurry this up? Some of us have to be up early tomorrow. This has to have been deliberate, Milo thought. Someone knows I have limited spells per day. They might even know that I routinely burn my remaining spell slots on Scholar's Touch before bed and schedule this accordingly. Why else would the Minister of Magic himself consent to an inquisition at this hour? Surely he has other things he could be doing. I think it's been established that I'm rubbish at potions, Milo said nervously. He had to kill time until he could prepare spells. Would anyone mind if I did a quick reread through my potions textbook to make sure I did this right? But you just have to stir it, Fudge said exasperately. Better safe than sorry, Milo said. If I mess up the stir, the whole experiment is void and I get buried in concrete. I might need the extra help. After all, help will always be given at Hogwarts. To those who ask for it, Dumbledore finished his motto softly. Very well. He said to the assembled government types, I think his request is reasonable enough. Dumbledore said it without any particular weight to it, but somehow it was very clear that, even if he wasn't technically in charge here, his word was one matter, on this one matter, was final. So I'll just run off and grab my text. I don't think so, Bode said firmly. If you are some sort of magical creature with powers unknown, I don't think we should let you out of our sight. Professor Snape, do you have a copy of whatever your first year textbook is on hand? Ashio magical drafts and potions, Snape said, and with a flick of his wand, a textbook flew out of a nearby bookshelf and into his hand. Convenient, Milo thought, and a lot less expensive than instant summons, that's for sure. Without a word, the potion master passed Milo the heavy, and more importantly, large textbook. If there's one thing about wizards, and wizards, it's that they never use standardized sheets of A4. Milo made a big show of opening up the book and reading it studiously. Very studiously. Twenty-eight eyes bored into Milo's as he, head as he, eventually, turned a page and continued reading at a snail's pace. Oh, surely this isn't necessary, Fudge said impatiently. Just go and stir the ruddy pot, boy. How far from the rim, Milo asked. How fast? With what length of spoon? No, I'm sorry, Minister, but my life is on the line here. If I'm going to stir it, I'm going to stir it right. I'll just be a minute. Milo turned another page. Minutes rolled by. Fudge glanced at his watch every few seconds and began his tapping his foot in irritation. Eventually... It's after midnight, Fudge muttered. Must we play along with this charade? Oh, it's not so bad, McGonagall said. I can't remember the last time I've seen someone his age, except for you, Miss Granger, of course, studying so diligently. What if he's delaying until the Veritasium wears off, Fudge asked. A simple enough question to answer, said Dumbledore. Milo, if you would be so kind as to answer, are you studying with the intention of delaying until the Veritasium wears off? No, sir, Milo said truthfully, and he had to stifle a laugh. That is not why I'm delaying. Well, there you have it, Dumbledore said. Fudge grumbled quietly to himself. Milo slowly reached into his belt of hidden pouches and recovered his most precious possession, his spell book. Slowly, very slowly, he lifted the thick, but small in terms of height and width, tome and placed it at such that it was hidden by magical drafts and potions. Milo grinned as he began preparing his spells. Good thing I was bedridden he all day, he thought. Gave me my required eight hours of rest. 
Spell preparation is a bit odd, is a bit of an odd quirk for the wizard class. It involved carefully poring over every intricate detail of the magic and memorizing it, but also, at the same time, casting the vast majority of the spell. 95% of the casting was done during the preparation, so that only the very final stage had, be done, had to be done on the fly. The result was that every wizard went about their day holding, depending on their level, potentially dozens of unimaginably complicated spells at the point of almost being finished. Each spell was like a sentence that wasn't that didn't just quite. It was a num it was it any wonder that so many powerful wizards went mad. Oh, not like I have anything better to do, Fudge muttered. Just a country to run, that's all. Don't mind me. It takes a wizard exactly one hour to prepare all of their spells, regardless of how many there are. However, a very infrequently used rule allows them to prepare a fraction of their daily allotment of spells in the same fraction of time, to a minimum of 15 minutes. Milo could prepare at most 17 spells per day, so in 15 minutes he could prepare one quarter of that, four spells. He chose Prestidigitation, Tensor's Floating Disc, Mage Hand, and Invisibility. He quickly stashed his spell book back into his belt and stood up. Okay, he said, let's do this thing. But if we're doing it, we're doing it right. I'm a wizard. I shouldn't have to prove that to you. But seeing as how you're forcing me, I want to make sure there are absolutely no doubts after the fact. And for that, I demand your largest cauldron. That was the end of chapter 12. Water break. And apparently the guys in the other room are enjoying whatever it is they're watching. Chapter 13. Role playing. The nerve! Who does he think he is? He is in no position to make demands. The reaction to Milo's request for a larger cauldron was varied. It's clearly a ploy, Snape sneered. He hopes to dilute the potion so that it won't explode in his face when he fails. It won't work. If he fails, Severus, Dumbledore said. No, Milo said. Scale up the other ingredients proportionately. There was a meaningful silence. Tell me, boy, Snape said finally. Do you have a death wish? Do you have any idea how large an explo- Oh, come now, Fudge interrupted. We're in the presence of six of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement's finest, not to mention the Supreme Mugwump himself. I think we have more than enough magical muscle between us to keep anyone from being harmed. Let's just get him a big cauldron and be done with it. But do remember to whom it is you are speaking, Severus. As you command, Se Snape said between clenched teeth. Ashio cauldron size 12. A large, heavy cauldron ponderously hovered from the storeroom, knocking over a variety of expensive-looking magical doodads in the process. It slowly came to a stop near the center of the room. Milo gave it a quick look. It's only two and a half feet in diameter, he thought. It needs to be bigger. No, Milo said. Bigger. That is the largest potions cauldron I keep in the dungeon, Snape protested angry. Unless you plan on cooking a troll. Of course, Dumbledore said. We can use one of the cooking pots from the kitchens. The house elves make enough oatmeal for hundreds of students on Tuesday mornings in just one pot. Except for this one occasion in 1941, where there was a shortage of rolled oats, and McGonagall coughed po pointedly. And where was I? Oh, yes. Before Snape could say something biting and sarcastic, Dumbledore clapped his hands twice. A small creature appeared in front of him with a loud crack. It was, if you round it up, entirely composed of large, floppy ears. What the hell? Milo wondered. Is that some sort of goblinoid? Floppy, would you be so good as to fetch the kitchen's largest cooking pot? Dumbledore asked kindly. Yes, master. Floppy responded in a high, squeaky voice. Right away, master. With another crack, Floppy was gone. There was only one explanation for the creature that Milo could think of. Impossible as it seemed. 
He'd heard that the kitchens were staffed by elves, which was insane, but this world seemed to turn everything he knew on its head. So that little goblin-like creature he saw... Milo broke into a cold sweat. Must be a slave of the elves. Of all the hundreds of subspecies of elf, only one kept slaves. Hogwarts has dark elves in the kitchen, he thought with growing horror. And they have been teleporting goblins into their employ. No wonder there was poison in that tart. There's enough chaotic and evil in the kitchen for it to qualify as a suburb of the abyss. After a few seconds, there were six simultaneous pops. A half dozen of the goblinoid slaves appeared carrying a mammoth pot over their heads. The goblins are apparently super strong, Milo noted with a steady rising panic, and can ignore Hogwarts' anti-teleportation abjurations. Oh god! Yeah, Milo said, tearing his eyes away from the humanoids. Th that'll do. As Snape began gathering buckets of glycerol and flobalworm mucus from his storeroom, Milo wondered briefly how he managed to fit everything in there before he realized the closet was probably of holding. Milo mentally ran over his plan. I can prevent the liquids from mixing using Tensor's floating disc, he thought. Tensor's floating disc was a moderately useful spell that created an invisible shallow bowl that hovers three feet off the ground. He could dump the mucus into the water, cast the spell above the liquid, then pour in the glycerol. The tricky thing is that it's three feet wide, but this cauldron is more than sufficient. Then it's sim a simple matter of using prestidigitation to create bubbles. Milo had never actually tried it, but he was pretty sure that creating a few bubbles in a pot fell within prestidigitation's ability to exert about a pound of force. There, Snape said with growing frustration. You have here precisely the correct amount of mucus and glycerol. He gestured to a pair of buckets. Can we get this over with now? You said the headmaster was to check them, Milo reminded him. Dumbledore thoroughly and, to the Minister of Magic's irritation, slowly examined the contents of both buckets. Everything seems to be in order, Dumbledore said. Would anyone else like to take a look? Hermione coughed awkwardly. I, I would, Headmaster, if it's all right, of course, she said. Milo blinked. Was this Hermione doubting her professors? What was the world coming to? Hermione, still wrapped in bandages, painfully limped over to the cooking pot in the center of the room. She examined it until she saw, engraved near the bottom in tiny letters, cast iron 112 gallons. Then she hobbled over to the side of the room and picked up a set of heavy brass scales. Then, with the Minister of Magic, two of her teachers, her headmaster, four senior ministry officials, and six aurors watching her intently, she limped over to Snape's desk. Carefully avoiding on eye contact with the motion potions master, she placed the heavy measuring scale on the desk, with a thud. Hermione's right arm was in a splint, and Milo could tell that she quickly realized there was no way she'd be able to lift either of the two buckets. She drew her wand. Six aurors drew their wands simultaneously and aimed at her. Hermione looked like she was going to die in panic. Peace, Dumbledore said. She was just, I presume, about to perform a simple hovering charm? Um, the featherweight charm, actually, Hermione said matter-of-factly although she still looked nervous. And then a hovering charm. You see, the two charms combined are over one-fifth more efficient than a single more powerful. Nobody asked for a lecture, Miss Granger, Snape snapped. Five points for Gryffindor, McGonagall said simultaneously. Upon hearing Snape's remark, she added, That's really rather clever, Miss Granger. The oars put away their wands, looking somewhat sheepish at having drawn on a twelve-year-old girl. The two heads of houses glared at each other as Hermione carefully weighed both buckets, dispelling the featherweight charm in the process, of course. She then nodded at Milo. Thanks, he muttered as she walked past him 
to her earlier position. Any time, she said simply. She looked a bit bemused. Oh, before you begin, said Bode, you should probably be informed that a number of anti-cheating enchantments have been placed in this classroom. Milo paused. Explain, he said. Obviously, I can't go into too much de detail, but just suffice to say that we'll be aware of any magical illusions that you create, or if you try to add anything to the potion without our knowledge. Milo frowned. This shouldn't cause any problems, he thought. Invisibility is the only illusion I'll be casting, and it isn't really an illusion that I create, exactly. That sounds like more of a figment or glamour. Hopefully. Well, I'd best begin. No time like the present. Pushing his fear and nervousness to the side... Milo tried to emulate the tone of a performing bard he'd once heard back in Myra. City of light, city of magic. All right, professors, minister, officials, government goons, just sit back. You're about to see magic done, Milo announced confidently, rolling up his sleeves. What does he think he is, a stage magician? M Fudge murmured quietly. This reminds me of a time I was in a tavern back in my world. Milo said as he unceremoniously dumped the bucket of thick, slimy fulbulworm mucus into the cauldron. It was a nice little place, as far as roadside taverns go. Their soup was terrible. It went by the name of Tensor's Floating Disco, he said, casting the spell. Fortunately enough, the story was true. A retired wizard built an entire establishment hovering two feet off the ground using a copious number of immovable rods. The disco was famed far and wide for its resilience to earthquakes, its dancing lights, and its terrible soup. Isn't he only eleven? Fudge said in admonishment. What tavern word? But that, of course, was in another world, Milo said, pouring the glycerol into the cauldron. Snape looked as if he were about to duck beneath his desk for cover. Unbeknownst to the audience, the thick liquid hit, instead of the water in the cauldron, Milo's magical disc. A world which now seems to exist only in the hazy reaches of my memory, and every day seems to be slipping deeper and deeper into the murky depths of invisibility. In the blink of an eye, the glycerol, which, if anyone had looked, would have appeared to be floating on the air inside the darkness of the cauldron, vanished. Milo grabbed his ladle and dipped it into the cauldron in the area between the force disc and the edge. The pot was so huge that, in order to stir it, he'd have to actually walk around the perimeter of the cast-iron monstrosity. When he was about three-quarters of the way around, he began to speak again. And this, as you will see, was no mere sleight of hand, ledger domain, or, he completed the, second, the circuit, prestidigitation. The pot bubbled. Milo almost couldn't believe that he might actually be getting away with it. He made the damned pot bubble, but nothing had exploded, and Lucia's plot was foiled. He felt light-headed. He wanted to go back to the Gryffindor common room and celebrate. Curious, Dumbledore said, raising his half-moon spectacles. Snape mild triumphantly. In this matter, I will, of course, defer to the potions master, Dumbledore said. But, Cerverus, does this potion usually bubble? Milo froze. No doubt, it's bubbling because of how vigorously young Milo wanted this potion to succeed, Snape suggested with amusement. Milo looked around the room in panic as Snape moved excitedly towards the cauldron to investigate. It's not supposed to bubble? He had miscalculated Snape. The devious potions master had anticipated Milo's ability to fake the effects of the potion and hadn't told him truthfully what they should, in fact, be. Milo looked pleadingly at Dumbledore and then at McGonagall, but neither offered him any help. He was sure to be ousted as a fake wizard and expelled from Hogwarts, falling right into Lucius' presumably evil plot, whatever it happened to be. Tap, tap, tap. Snape's polished leather loafers made sound, echoing, made loud, echoing sounds as the greasy potions pr master approached. In blind desperation, Milo looked into the faces of the minister his cronies, even the mo mooks. I need help, he thought frantically. I need someone who knows what... Oh, right. Catching Hermione's eye, she mouthed, It turns purple. Milo had heard that, in the distant past, 
Only rogues were able to read lips. He was blissfully happily, happy that this was no longer the case. Fortunately, prestidigitation, which in Milo's firm opinion was the best spell ever invented, I agree, um, could last up to an hour, and it could recolor liquids. The spell wasn't an illusion. It actually changed the object's color, so it hopefully wouldn't trigger the wards. By the time Snape got to the cauldron, the liquid inside was a pale shade of violet. Milo, Milo could feel his heart pounding against his chest as he waited for the anti-cheating alarms to sound. He nearly fainted with relief when nothing happened, although the potion still had to pass one more step. Milo just hoped he'd got the shade of purple right. Snape peered inside suspiciously, and then did something Milo hadn't anticipated. To Milo's horror, Snape picked up the ladle. As he moved to dip it into the pot, presumably to investigate the potion, Milo ran through his options. Tensor's floating disc was not a dismissible spell. At Milo's level, it would be blocking the majority of the cauldron's opening for another five hours. Snape was sure to discover the invisible force disc, and Milo would be expelled, then presumably killed horribly by Death Eaters. Sorry, what was that, Hermione? Milo asked loudly, improvising wildly. You require my help tying your shoes because your arm was grievously injured while Snape was supposed to be protecting you from a troll? Why, of course I can help you! Technically, no lies. Milo bolted toward Hermione as fast as he could run. Milo collapsed at Hermione's feet and stare started fumbling with her laces. What on earth are you? she asked, surprised. Tensor's floating disc disappears if you move out of the spell's range, Milo explained quietly. I need to get another ten feet away from the cauldron before Snape realizes what's going on. Hermione's back was to the door. Ten feet would put Milo in the hallway. You rat, Hermione asked, whispered. Ask him to run out and chase him. Good plan. Morty? Don't need to tell me twice, boss! Milo's familiar squeaked. Morty leapt out of Milo's belt and made a mad dash for the exit. Snape dipped the ladle into the cauldron, and Milo heard a quiet thud as the steel instrument hit his force bowl. Snape blinked. What? he began. Mordecai! Milo shouted and pursued. Shortly after he reached the exit, he heard a muffled splash from the cauldron as the tensor's floating disc winked out of existence. Here now, Fudge said. We can't have him just leave. There was a brief pause. Everyone duck for cover, someone shouted. Evidently, they had taken Milo's flight to mean that the potion was about to explode. Asio Milo, one of the aurors muttered, and Milo felt a strange tug in the region of his stomach. The next thing he knew, he was being pulled into the center of the room by invisible hands. He was a weird feeling. You'll have to look for your rat later, Milo, Bode said in his dry monotone. We can't allow you to leave until the inquiries are closed. Right, of course, Milo said. Be careful not to lie, he reminded himself. I'm only eleven. Eleven years old eleven year olds are notoriously notoriously flighty. You don't need to tell me twice, twice, McGonagall muttered. Snape, who had evidently been distracted by Ni Milo's unexpected flight, began to test the potion again. As soon as his ladle entered the cauldron, Milo had a burst of mad inspiration. I think I've had more... I've more than proved that I'm a legitimate mage. Hand me that quill, headmaster, would you? Sorry, what was that? Fudge asked. Milo concentrated on the mage hand spell. A handy, sorry, weak telekinesis, and targeting the water in the cauldron. Mage hand can't target held objects such as Snape's ladle. Milo created a small current, which forced the ladle to move in a very tiny counterclockwise circle. Snape frowned. He wasn't sure if it was a trick of his eye, but he could have sworn that the purple potion became slightly darker as he stared at it. I was just asking the headmaster to hand me the quill on his desk, Milo said, but on second thought I realize I don't need it. How's the potion check, Professor Snape? I think you're... Student might be a bit funny, said Fudge said, not quietly enough to Dumbledore. A tad off in the head, if you catch my meaning. I am quite sorry, Dumbledore said apologetically. I didn't bring my fishing rod. 
I had no idea we were going to out to catch meanings on this fine evening. Why, once when I was a boy, my brother and I caught a meaning that weighed... McGonagall coughed again. Per perhaps that story is best told later, Dumbledore said. Fudge sighed and muttered something under his breath. Milo wasn't sure, but he thought the words surrounded by nutters was somewhere in there. Snape carefully extracted a small amount of the potion with his ladle and stared at it in astonishment. Well, the minister pressed, what's the verdict, Severus? Snape glared at the contents of the, con of the cauldron, his face livid with barely contained rage. You, he said, turning to Milo. His voice was like a polar ray with a confirmed critical. If I ever find out how you did this, boy, you'll rue the day your mother first laid eyes on your father. Severus, Dumbledore said reproachfully. Snape reined himself in with obvious effort. I have the unequaled pleasure, Snape said through clenched teeth, but Milo was pretty sure he meant the other thing. To say that this potion is, against all odds and reason, adequate. McGonagall looked relieved. Bode appeared somewhat disappointed. Milo was willing to bet that Bode hoped he'd discovered some form of new and exotic humanoid monster in Milo, while Dumbledore, and only Dumbledore, started clapping. Hermione stood in the corner, beaming at him. Best of all, he earned 800 XP. That alone will cover months of item crafting, Milo thought. <sighs> Ruddy waste of time this was, Fudge complained to Umbridge as the ministry officials filed out. Wonder why he insisted it be done so late at night, and on a weekend, too. Minerva, Dumbledore asked politely, would you please take Miss Granger back to the hospital wing? Of course, Albus, McGonagall said politely, and moved to the injured girl. Snape was pacing back and forth by the cauldron, fuming. Milo, Dumbledore said, I understand that it's late, and you have class tomorrow. But would you mind coming into my office for a brief chat? Of course, Headmaster, Milo said politely. There were new, no rules anywhere for sleep deprivation. Ergo, Milo could stay up as late as he wanted. The eccentric Headmaster led Milo through the labyrinth castle, up the stairs, skipping, unconsciously, the trick step on the second floor staircase, and at last, to a random dead end. Uh, Milo said, isn't your office just out here in the hall, is it? Sherbert Lemon, Dumbledore said. That's not really an answer, you know. Ah, uh, young Milo, in that you are wrong. A nearby, nearby gargoyle statue slowly began to move. Holy crap, gargoyle! Milo shrieked. Glitter dust! He held out his hand, but nothing happened. Right, he thought embarrassed. I'm completely out of spells. Until he had a chance to prepare new spells, Milo was basically a commoner with a high will save and a pet rat. The gargoyle, however, proved to be merely a statue, which rose as it turned, revealing a spiral staircase. Sweet entrance, Milo said appreciatively. No pun intended, Dumbledore asked Riley. What? Well, you said sweet entrance, and the password, of course, is my favorite form of sweet. Milo stared at him blankly. The headmaster just sighed and began climbing the formidable staircase. Dumbledore's office was awesome. There was simply no other word to describe it. Wondrous items of all sorts decorated every flat surface Milo could see, many of which were ticking at inconsistent, conflicting speeds, no doubt Milo assumed to confuse his enemies. Up on the walls were animated portraits looking down at them, and in the corner lay the sorting hat. Please sit down, Dumbledore said. Can I get you anything? Cocoa? Tea? That first one, Milo requested. I have no idea what it is. Dumbledore waved his hand lazily, and a large cup of a large mug of hot cocoa appeared in front of Milo. They have a spell for that? Milo wondered. For just conjuring steaming hot cups of cocoa? You're probably wondering why I've invited you here, Dumbledore said. Unless, of course, it's a spell that summons arbitrary hot drinks. Actually, I was wondering what spell you used to conjure the drinks, Milo said, then frowned. 
Wait, why on the prime material did I just say that? A non-verbal variant of the summoning charm, Dumbledore shrugged, created by Helga Hufflepuff her herself to summon food from the kitchens of Hogwarts. It only works within the grounds. I must still be under the effects of the Veritasium, Milo realized. Was that why Dumbledore had summoned him up here now? Now you're probably wondering why I've invited you here, Dumbledore asked, somewhat helpfully. No, I was wondering if you invited me here now because I'm still compelled to speak only the truth, Milo said. Ah-ha! Dumbledore chuckled. As much as I feel the world could do with a little more honesty, no, that's not the reason. I was traveling the past few days, Wizigmot business, you understand, and my sleep schedule is quite turned upside down. This was the first in quite some time that I've had a spare moment, in fact. I see, Milo said. Okay, I'll bite. Now I'm wondering why you've invited me here. I wanted to know how you did it, Dumbledore said. Did what? Faked the potion well enough to fool Snape. That's no easy task, you know. Milo froze. He nearly dropped his cocoa. Which, by the way, was delicious. Oh, don't worry, Dumbledore said. I'm not ministry. You're not in trouble. Milo only then realized how vulnerable he was. No spells, no familiar, no one who knew where he was, no escape plan, no ability to lie. I used magic to keep the mucus from mixing with the glycerol, Milo confessed, then ended the spell right as Snape tested the potion. I then used some very weak telekinesis to cause Snape to accidentally stir the liquid, thus com completing the final step in creating the potion. You mean to say that Snape created the potion? Dumbledore asked, amazed. Then he burst out laughing, and continued to do so and there, until there were tears in his eyes. I haven't laughed so hard in days, he admitted. Oh, oh, don't worry, your secret's safe with me. Yeah, I, I guess it is pretty funny, Milo conceded, and thanks. Don't mention it. Not since the days of Elmric the Evil were headmasters involved in the business of having their students executed. But that wasn't the only reason why I asked you here. Oh? You fought a troll on Halloween, Dumbledore said. Instead of doing the sensible thing and getting trained, fully qualified adult witches and wizards to handle it. Why? It came at me, bro, Milo said. You could have run for it, Dumbledore countered. It had me cornered. You could have jumped out the window, Dumbledore pressed. You have, after all, a spell for that exact purpose. Milo frowned. He could have easily escaped the troll with Featherfall, now that he thought about it. The thought never occurred to me, Milo answered honestly. Why not? Dumbledore asked. For nearly anyone else in the world, it would be the only thought that occurred to them. It's not what I do, Milo said. Running away from monsters, that is. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled. But have you ever asked yourself, why not? I... no. No, I haven't. Milo paused. But only because I haven't had to. I'm an adventurer. Fighting monsters is what I do. Because you're an adventurer, so you do it for the sense of adventure... No, that's not it at all. It's it's hard to explain. How do you explain to someone something that's so obvious? Adventurers fight monsters. That's just how it is. You'd have as much luck trying to explain to someone why two and two make four. You're a smart boy. Try. I'm, I'm a PC, an adventurer, a hero. When there's a monster or an evil necromancer or a murderer or whatever, it's my job to take him out. But in this case, in Hogwarts, there are others who could fight that troll, do that job, at least as well as you could. It... it doesn't matter. I was there. The troll was there. It happened for a reason. I was supposed to fight that troll. You're a bit young to have such stock in fate. Not fate. Planning by a higher power. By God? Dumbledore asked. <laughs> no, in my experience, gods spend too much time fighting amongst themselves and making powerful, yet shockingly unoptimized magical artifacts and holy relics to plan people's lives out. 
Then who? Uh, the same entity that makes sure that eventually a villain will always be defeated by a hero. That arranges for Draco and Har Harry to be the same age at the same school. That arranges for the Philosopher's Stone to be hidden at the same school in their first year. That keeps the background world running when we're not looking at it. That sounds like fate to me, Dumbledore said. Except maybe for that last one. Milo simply shrugged. So you believe it is your fate to fight monsters? Dumbledore pressed. I, I don't think I'm being clear, Milo said. I fight monsters. I'm an adventurer. A hero. It's a fact of life. There's no why to it. It's just how my life goes. Is it to protect innocent lives? Dumbledore asked. Not really, but when it happens, that's a perk, I suppose. To right great imbalances in the universe? No. Are there great imbalances I wasn't aware of? Not to my knowledge. Is it for revenge? No, I don't have anything I feel all that bitter about. For the thrill, then? I don't do anything for the thrill of it. For glory and respect. No, without leadership, glory's about as useful a skill as focus craft basket weaving. And you don't see yourself as a leader, then? A planner, maybe, but a leader? One who stands on a crate and gives inspiring speeches to a bunch of low-level commoners and warriors? No, I'll, I'll leave that to someone else. What's all? What's with all the questions, Headmaster? Dumbledore sighed heavily. I've known witches and wizards, and more than a few muggles for that matter, who set forth to battle evil without any clear motivation for doing so. They tend to fit into one of two categories. Either they discover the reasons within themselves later and go on to do great things, or, more often, they fall. They die? Because I'd have to disagree, Professor. Neutral adventurers tend to be much more pragmatic and level-headed, and overall far less likely to die some stupid sacrifice or last stand than good ones. Sometimes they do, Dumbledore admitted soberly. But more often, they find themselves becoming what they once fought. What? They go evil? I don't think I'm in any danger of that. It's just not in character. Milo sighed. I'm not... I'm not really equipped to discuss philosophy, Headmaster. And why is that? I... I fight monsters, he said firmly. I kick down doors. I find treasure. I gain experience. I spend an inordinate amount of time in taverns. I operate best in groups of four. I solve mysteries. I use magic. I don't... The discussion of why rarely comes up. And even then, if it did, the reason for it would suddenly appear in my head. Poof, like it had always been there. The same as if you asked me what my parents' names were. It's like a part of me, the part that makes those decisions and created the history and the hopes and the dreams, it's gone. I'm just the collection of stats and spells with a race and alignment. I don't know how to explain it. To my knowledge, this has never happened to anyone before. It's like I'm a, I'm a character in a play and the player was left behind when I was brought here. Maybe, said Dumbledore, it's time you started to think for yourself, to be more than a simple mask. Are you suggesting? If you're a character, Dumbledore shrugged, I don't see any reason why you can't be your own player. Milo stared at the headmaster, completely dumbstruck. And now, I believe, it is time for us to go to bed. You seem to be quite recovered, but would you do me one more favor and spend the night in the hospital wing? You'll see why tomorrow, Dumbledore said. Sure, Milo shrugged. He was used to sleeping in the wilderness and in ancient crypts anyways, with a step and a half, while a step and a half down from the four-poster beds in Gryffindor Tower, the hospital cots were a great deal more comfortable than a bedroll, not when it came to it that Milo much cared. Good night, Milo. Good night, Professor. Milo was already halfway back to the hospital wing when he realized that, 
When Dumbledore asked him how he faked the potion, it meant he actually believed that Milo was a different sort of wizard. What does he know that I don't? Or rather, what does he know that I don't know that I don't know that he knows? And why does Lucius want me expelled? And who really killed the Acromantula? And why is it missing a fang? The lack of injuries on the nonetheless dead spider implied one thing. Death effect. The killing curse. Dun dun dun! Um, thank you so much to all of our patrons because you guys help make all of the craziness in my life possible, including this lovely microphone that works so much better than the headset that kept cutting out. Oh, so much better. And if you'd like to support our channel, either by becoming a patron or by purchasing us a jittery beverage, um, the links are in the about page here on Twitch. We also have a YouTube channel where all of this stuff is archived and where our more scripted content also ends up. Thank you again all so much for being here. Um, remember, if people can hate for no freaking reason, then I can love for no freaking reason. So I love you and please spread that love. Take care. Have a good night.